Hey, hi, everybody. Thank you. My name is David Brasalski. I'm an IP and patent attorney and partner at Gerhard Law. We, Gerhard Law is a kind of a, a kind of full service IP firm uh, with like international reach and kind of global uh, scope. We have clients that are not just based in the United States, but based around the world. I myself am calling you from uh, Israel today, where I spend 50% uh, of my time and the other 50% I'm in New Jersey. Uh, we've been putting on the uh, ESS, the Entrepreneurial Strategy Series, for about almost three years now. It's usually the last Thursday of every month at 12 p.m. Eastern. And so we have a whole, uh, we have literally, we have mapped out all of 2024. So there are great events that are coming, but we are super excited for this one. Um, it's always good to hear from uh, other entrepreneurs in different sectors and kind of hear firsthand what they had to go through. Um, and, and we'll be touching on a variety of, of, of subjects as well. Most of our presentations are kind of informal like this and kind of like a fireside chat. And so we encourage you uh, to ask questions in the chat. Maybe we'll read them at the same time. Maybe we'll get to them at the end. But, um, but we encourage you to comment and ask questions as we go along. I'm going to let uh, the speakers introduce themselves um, because um, it's just better that way, I think, sometimes. But I, I think we're going to start with Paul Lewis, um, who is here and is the founder of Calamu. Um, so, Paul, maybe just you know, a, a few minutes of who you are and kind of what, and, and what Kalamu is. We'll get into some of the, you know, dirty details later, but just a kind of, uh, you know, brief overview as to who you are. Yeah, cool. Good. Great. Thanks, David. First off, it's, it was fascinating listening to the first half hour of this and listening to everybody's journey and everybody's got a story, right? So um, thank you for everybody that shared with that. So my name is Paul Lewis. I'm the CEO of a company called Kalamu Technologies, and we are a cybersecurity platform. We've created the world's first data harbor, uh, and a data harbor is a storage construct that's in the cloud that allows data to completely absorb a ransomware attack. Uh, and we do this in real time. We do this with no lost data and no downtime. Um, we're, we're a startup company. I started the company in 2019. Um, we're, we're still in the very early stages. We have some proof of concepts going with some large enterprise companies around the world, uh, but still, you know, still in the fun stages of the, the early days here. Um, prior to Calamu, I was executive managing director for a company in New York City, a consulting firm in New York City, uh, where I ran the whole cyber practice worldwide. And it's where I came up with the idea for Calamu, um, because I just got tired of working with my clients around the globe large companies that were hit with cyber attacks and ransomware attacks and just tired of the bad guys being smarter than the good guys and decided I wanted to do something to try to solve that problem. Uh, earlier in my career, I founded two other companies, uh, both in information security, you know, kind of I'm always been in sort of disruptive technology. That's kind of the area that I like to play in. Um, and those two companies were both acquired. They were both strategically acquired by two different Fortune 500 companies uh, early in my career. So I guess I got a little bit lucky early. Um, I actually started my first company not too far from Gearheart Law in New Jersey. I went to Fairleigh Dickinson University and started my first company in my dorm room there um, and eventually grow, grew that. And that was one of the companies that was strategically acquired. Um, so I guess I've been doing this for a long time. I've I never really worked in a, in a corporate job. Uh, other than post acquisition, um, so but just delighted to be here and share my story. Thanks, David. Awesome. We are excited that you're here. Um, we'll come back to you shortly. Um, then our next uh, founder is uh, Abe Kamark of True Made Foods. Abe, uh, maybe you can uh, take a few minutes to introduce yourself and uh, let everybody know who you are. Yeah, so um, my name is Abe Kmark. I'm the founder and CEO of True Made Foods, co-founder. Um, we are a, a better for you uh, food company. We make uh, we focus on condiments, uh, mostly ketchup and barbecue sauce. Um, these are we create no sugar, all natural versions of these uh, great American staples. Um, trying to make it easy uh, for parents and families to eat healthy and feed their families healthy food. Um, without having to give up, you know, such important things like the backyard barbecue. Uh, 
So we take uh, we take out all the high fructose corn syrup and added sugars, and we use natural foods like uh, fruit and vegetables, like carrots and butternut squash, to naturally sweeten our products. And it turns out they actually taste better that way. Um, so we don't use any stevia or sugar alcohols or artificial sweeteners. It's really literally just pureed fruits and vegetables kind of going back. We, we innovate by looking backwards, um, kind of cooking the way our grandparents and great grandparents used to cook um, to bring back real food and real flavor. Awesome. Thank you, Abe. Where, 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 can you let people know where you're located? Oh, yeah. Sorry. I'm in um, Alexandria, Virginia. So just outside Washington, D.C. Um, yeah, and our products are available nationally. Um, most of our ketchup is available nationally, any Whole Foods, um, most major retailers. Um, you can, of course, find all of our products on Amazon or on our website, truemadefoods.com, too. Awesome. Thanks, Abe. We'll come back to you shortly as well. Our last uh, founder is Caleb Olfers, but he literally just texted me, which is so typical of a founder. And he's like, I'm trying, he's like uh, on an investor call, trying to wrap it up. So as soon as he, as soon as he comes in, we will introduce him, but we, and we'll get his thoughts on some of the topics we'll talk about, but um, the show definitely must go on. So I'm going to just kind of throw some topics out there and I'd love to get Paul and uh, Abe's uh, um, opinions. So first of all, I mean, we can't, we can't not talk about being a founder or being a startup without talking about intellectual property. And because I'm a little biased because I am an IP attorney. So I want to know, Paul, at least for Kalamu or maybe even your your previous uh, companies, um, I think Caleb is joining us. So hold on. I, I, hold on. I may ask Caleb. Caleb, are you with us? I'm here. I'm so sorry I'm late. Caleb, what's up? Are you coming on camera? I can't see you. I'm coming. Should be coming through. Awesome, Caleb. So we told everyone that you were on a call with an investor, which is, and Paul, <laughs> I'll come back to you in a second. Caleb, we told everyone you were on a call with an investor. So, you know, let us know who you are, what you're doing, and, um, you know, what's up? What are you working on? <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah, I'm Caleb. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Haven Athletic. My background is marketing for tech companies, uh, started a couple of smaller tech companies, and then wound up in the e-commerce space, uh, found a unique opportunity to work on a organized gym bag and basically consider ourselves kind of like what Yeti did to coolers. We're doing that to the athletic bag space by adding compartments and dividers and structure and ventilation and a special spot for your shoes. And over the last three years, we've grown 200 to 500% year over year, and we work with a ton of professional athletes. Uh, across all major sports in a really unique way uh, because of our product. Amazing. Caleb, we're so I'm happy so happy you were able to join. Just text me when you have a few minutes left. I know Caleb had has to uh, uh, probably jump on a plane uh, shortly. so just text me privately when you have a few minutes left and 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 we'll make sure to kind of get some parting words from you. Okay, Back that sounds great. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Of course, of course. Paul. Intellectual property, Steven. like what, 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 what's your, like, what, what do you got, you know, your patents, trademarks, copyrights, like, you know, your overall kind of thoughts on it. Um, uh, if you want to talk about the article that you were just recently quoted in, I think that would be very interesting to some folks as well, but I'll, I'll, I'll kind of, I'll kind of leave it okay. to you. Yeah. All right. Sure. I, you brought up the article. I think the article came out <laughs> yesterday or the day before yes. I, and, and what was it, David, you saw it was the China. China it News was, Daily, or it, it, it was the it was the South China Morning Post, is yep. what it was. Okay, yeah. okay, um, and it was an interesting article talking about um, the approach to patents and IP, the difference between China and the U.S., and how China is kind of really moving forward much more quickly than the U.S. in patents. But interesting article. I could post the link in the chat uh, to the article if anybody would like to see that. Um, so with Calamu, I do have several patents. I have domestic patents and I have international patents, but I just want to say I filed my first patent. Actually, I had my name on the my first patent that I was involved with when I was 17. And that was like the highlight of my life when that happened. I'm like, that was the coolest thing that I could imagine. Um, I think that patent's like long expired in it. And uh, I think the folks that were the inventors were very kind to include my name on it for the contribution that I had. But um but my approach to patents, I think, is a little bit 
different, or I think it's a little bit different. I really use a patent and kind of developing the patent and writing the patent to help vet a solution. So with what I'm trying to build, uh, and it helps me really kind of, you know, hone in on what my strategy is going to be on on what it is that I want to build. It's good. It's good to like just brainstorm and go through that process. Um, I, it also helps me with researching. I like to look at, you know, you do the kind of competitive analysis to see what other IP exists that might be similar. So when you go through that, you know, the patent search process, you identify companies that have ideas that are similar. And then I use that information to investigate those companies. And are they successful or are, did they fail? Do they, you know, is there any movement? Is there anything that's going on? And it kind of helps me determine the market that I'm trying to get into. Uh, if it's a, a feasible market or not. So I just use it for competitive analysis. I also use it for a marketing tool. Um, it is something that investors love when you have patents that are issued. That's just, you know, a great, great feather in your cap. And customers like to know that you've got you know, intellectual property that's protected. Uh, so it helps with marketing. But one thing that I never want to do when I get a patent is think about patent litigation. I don't want to be in the business of trying to defend my patent, and I don't want to be in the business of somebody saying I'm infringing on their patent. Um, it's just my, just personally, I don't want to be involved in litigation. But um, so I use patents for a, a little bit of a different strategy. Uh, I also use trademarks. So, and I use trademarks. Um, it, you know, why they're important to me is if I want to protect the name, obviously. So, Calamu, the name Calamu is trademarked. Um, I, I want to make sure nobody else is going to use that name or start a company using that same name. Uh, and I told you that we created this thing, this uh, storage construct called a, a Data Harbor. We patented the name or we trademarked the name Data Harbor and a, a couple of others that are around our process. Uh, but I intentionally don't want to trademark things that I want to be like the next wave. Like even if we come up with the concept internally, um, I, I want the world to be using that term. Um, so there are some situations where I just absolutely would not want to get a trademark on a term. Yeah, Paul, I have two questions for you, actually, and then and then 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 we'll move to the to the other speakers. Um, the the first thing I want to ask you is like typically like people say like especially in software like you know oh patents like I, I think there's like a fifty percent kind of mix going on of like yes I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna go the patent route and not really gonna go the patent route. What are your kind of thoughts on that? I'm just curious if you have any thoughts. Yeah. About so, I mean, you know, with software, with technology, it, it, innovation happens so quickly in technology that you might not have time to get a patent or it, it might not, it just might be a distraction to you. If you have something that you think is going to be disruptive and long term, then, you know, that's what I look for. And, that, and that's a solution that I would try to patent. Uh, but if it's something that's going to be, you know, a quick fix to existing technology that might have a year or two life cycle, uh, I probably wouldn't even consider it. Okay, great. Good to know. And then just one one more question. I think we'll come back to it in, in uh, uh, we'll kind of delve into it deeper. How have you used your patents in terms of your investors? Like, is it something that 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 you that, that your particular investors really wanted to see, or it was just a nice to have? Um, it depends on the investor and it really depends on the, for me, my, my personal experience, it depended on the amount of money that I was trying to raise. So I think patents are super important to angel investors. Um, they want to just make sure that they're getting into something that, that there's some protection. And I think they also like, look, a lot of, a lot of startups don't make it right. So especially in the seed round or the angel round, if you do have patents, there is some value that if the company doesn't survive, there's still an asset that that could have some value or could be sold, uh, even if the the initial company doesn't go. Um, now, I don't have a lot of experience with investors, so we, you know, with Calamu, we we did two rounds of investment. Uh, the second round that we did was with Dell Technologies and Insight Partners, a large VC, and the patents were were like more nice to have for them. They they liked the idea that we had the patents, but I don't think it would have been a deal killer for either one of them. Okay, good to know. I, I I appreciate that 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 transparency and honesty. Let's move away from patents. Let's go to Abe, True Made Foods. Well, I think the first question is, you know, as a food company, uh, you know, I, I don't want I don't want to make any I, I don't want I know the answer, but I don't want to make any assumptions for anybody else. 
do you have a patent on your ketchup formula or is it a trade secret or what type of IP protection do you have? Yeah, I mean, when it comes to when it comes to recipes, unfortunately, like food and beverage is uh, it's very hard, near impossible to get a patent on your recipe. Um, this is why you hear about Coca-Cola having or KFC having you know, secret vaults with their recipes and then so on. It's not just a marketing gimmick. Um, so it is for them a big part of their marketing gimmick. Um, it, it's like they, you literally, you cannot patent or protect a recipe. Um, it's very difficult. People have tried to do it in the past. Um, so if you ever hear a startup, food startup saying they have a patented recipe or something like this, they are probably full of it or they've wasted a ton of time and money on something that's not going to actually protect them. Um, you, so we don't have patents on our recipe. Um, we have to be very careful about our, sharing our recipe. Um, unfortunately, because we don't self-manufacture, we co-pack, um, which means we use third-party manufacturers to make our, all our products. Um, we have to share our recipes a lot. And um, that means assigning lots of NDAs, um, which again, are not necessarily um, protective, but are part of the risk. And um, already we've seen copycats in the market. Um, Heinz launched a veggie a veggie ketchup, the ketchup that uses carrots and butternut squash in it um, a few years ago in 2018. Um, luckily, that was the same year that we kind of, we pivoted away from having a, we initially had like a low sugar ketchup that was focused on like the extra veggies, the carrots and butternut squash in it. And we, we pivoted that um, that year away and did a, a, a no sugar and really kind of focused more on the sugar content and then the natural ingredients second. And so that helped us get around that um, competition. Um, we are now seeing private label starting to copy our recipe somewhat. Um, the good thing is, is like uh, they can't quite copy our recipe, recipe perfectly. Nobody's been able to do it um, or they don't wanna spend the money to do it. And so they end up um, with uh, cheaper versions that don't taste as good. Um, it still confuses the market, makes it more competitive on shelf. Um, and just makes it you know, a little bit harder for us, but that's the nature of being in the food industry. Um, so yeah, there is a, what we have to focus on instead when it comes to things we patent our trademark, um, that, that's very important, um, especially if you start to export. Um, and we patent um, a lot of our, or we don't patent, sorry, but we trademark a lot of our, our, our sayings, um, our marketing slogans, um, things like this, because that helps cement your positioning your marketing positioning which is very important um and really the most important thing when you're trying to compete on shelf it's all about your quick differentiation with the customer because you've got like less than a second to differentiate your product amongst thousands of our hundreds of other products on shelf um so being able to patent something like um you know 100 flavor zero percent sugar or um uh cut the sugar keep the flavor uh, marketing terms that really helps us um uh, or not patent i keep saying patent but trademark those terms <laughs> um are very important to uh you know protecting our marketing positioning which is um because that's really all you have as a food and and and, and abe uh, so so just so, so everybody know uh, i met abe um uh must have been like maybe 10 or 10 years ago at foodex which was uh, which was a VC backed, ago, right, we, we, something that could have been around that time, which was like a VC backed food accelerator. And so you were invested in without mm -hmm. having patents or anything like that, right. but really just on your product and your brand. Can you talk a little bit about that experience and kind of like, you know, kind of how that all went down? Yeah, we, um, uh, so the way we launched the company, so to, we launched in 2015 or we started in 2015, um, which is when I met David. And uh, that was, a, it was a frothier time um, to say the least when it came to investment, especially in food investment. Um, and uh, there was a lot of accelerators popping up that were trying to mimic tech accelerators, um, like the Y Combinator model, but do it for food. Um, and so that's what actually helped me launch the, the company. I, I don't think I would have done it if I hadn't gotten into the accelerator and gotten the initial like $50,000 in seed capital and kind of like the introduction to follow on investors and so on and the help from the accelerator. Um, even though the accelerator model doesn't quite work as well for food as it does for um, uh, tech, 
companies, it is, uh, you, you know, very helpful to immediately expand your network and to give you a little bit of a stamp of approval, you know, that, you know, somebody invested in you, somebody believed in you. Um, but yeah, you know, the not having a patent on the recipe or anything like that was um, far from the last thing anybody was really concerned about. Um, and any investor um, who does ask about patents or worries about patents or IP protection when it comes to food, really just you should probably stay away from because they just don't understand the industry at all. And so that kind of dumb money, well, it's the money is still green, can still be dangerous in the long term if they have um, any say or control over what you do over the long term. Yeah, good point. I appreciate that. Thank you, Abe. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, Kayla, um, you, uh, would love to kind of hear your thoughts about uh, intellectual property, what do you have? How have you used it? Stuff like that. Yeah, for sure. So in our space, um, creating a gym bag and adding some organization to it, while it was really difficult to manufacture and it's way more expensive to manufacture and ship, and that's a little bit of our moat. In general, like if a big company wanted to come along and rip us off, they probably could. And so we thought about it early on from the standpoint of like, how do we add a little bit of protection? Because we think that this could be something very big. And that's when we started talking to David and working through this process of like, is this something patentable? Is this something, is there something that we can protect here? And especially over the last like maybe 10 years or so, design patents have gained a lot of steam and a lot of credibility. They initially were kind of like, you know, that doesn't really matter. It has to be utility. It has to have this function. Um, but you don't have to look further than like Apple and Samsung fighting constantly over designs of their phone. And Apple just won a $500 million case against Samsung for a design patent specifically. And that gave us a lot of like faith in moving forward with this, along with like David's recommendation that, that this is a good thing. And when you look at what we've developed, it is pretty simple. And that actually kind of lends itself to uh, strength in the patent where when it comes to design, you have to take like a layman's approach of if someone's infringing, does it look similar or not? Like would an average person say it looks similar? And when you look at our product, uh, to make something not similar, you would have to make it very unfunctional. Uh, so it wouldn't work near as well. And even then, you're still going to probably look like you're infringing. And so... That's why we felt pretty strong going forward with it in the beginning. And uh, what about trademarks? Because I think it's I, I think it's especially important to you and, and probably a because you sell on Amazon, right? If I'm not mistaken, yeah. Yeah, we do sell on Amazon. We're working through the we've been we've been back and forth on the trademark process here for a while. On, you know, the name and the logo and the likeness. There's a it's a fairly common name in a lot of different industries. The name Haven, even if we had Haven Athletic on there and. So we've been back and forth on that. Um, I think we'll, we'll probably end up with, with a trademark there. And then one other thing that we've added on um, is this term, which is kind of silly, but it's the term shoe garage. And essentially in, in our duffel bag, there's a specific spot for your shoes that's molded, it's formed, so you can easily slide your shoes in and out. It's, a, it's like a silly but very fun innovation and people really love it. People love that their shoes are separate. And we kind of jokingly called it shoe garage. And then all of our customers started picking it up and using it. And they're like, yeah, it's got the shoe garage. It's super neat. And we're like, I think we should probably like own this term. And so we've been, we've been going down the road there trying to own that term as well. So no one else can steal it. Awesome. Yeah, that's great. Let me, let me stick on you for a little bit. So ha have, have, have you raised like I, 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 as part of your journey, have you like sought investment? Have, have you, have you been talking to investors? And if so, has the IP been a topic of conversation for a consumer product good? Yeah, we've raised a small amount, mostly friends and family, but I've had a lot of conversations with investors and uh, sometimes like they totally get it. They they like that we have the patent, um, but we're maybe not in their space or they're, they're not looking with you invest um, at that time. There's a handful of people. I think there's still a lot of education to, um, to be shared around patents, design patents, because there's some uneducated people in the uh, consumer investing space that just don't get it. And like kind of their first fear is that we're going to be ripped off. And I'm like, okay, let's explain what a patent is and how this works. Yeah, no, I agree with you. There's definitely some uh, investors that could probably, you know, uh, 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 need in some sort of education for sure. A hundred percent. Yeah. Um, and, and so, so, but, but for, can you talk about the, can you talk about the, the, so, 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 so before you came on the call, there was like, there, there were people introducing themselves and four or five people uh, that had startups 
are running out of money. Everybody's running out of money, right? It, and which is which is what the startup life is all about. And so, can you talk a little bit about like you know, have you been down that road where you've run out of money, and who are you calling, and how are you finding them, and is it just friends and family, and you know, when is it too much to ask, or when do you stop asking? Like you're, you're. I, I don't know if that. It, just your thoughts on just asking for money when you've run out of money. We'd love to hear your thoughts on that. You know. Yeah, yeah. Um, we've run out of money a lot uh, <laughs> because we're bootstrapped. Uh, we pre-sell the product, so customers tend to like fund our orders for us. Um, and we've been through a lot, a lot figuring out like how to be really creative. We've done a lot of debt. We've even done some like pretty negative debt if you're familiar with like shopify capital or wayfire and you know it's, it's cash that you can get but like typically these loans are pretty predatory um and they you know like the effective apr rate because you're paying back on day one after you take the loan ends up being like 1600 percent um and so i'm like very aware that these are like awful things to do but also when you're in a rock and a hard place you're like well i need to buy product and my company can die or i could take this like kind of crappy loan uh so we've had to do that a few times we've paid a lot of them off we have one now that we're in the middle of paying off and it's been fairly functional for us. Um, we've also talked to some investors. Like I said, we brought on a little bit of friends and family. And it's a, it's a, in e-commerce, it's very interesting. You generally kind of need to know someone who wants to fund it before you go out and do it, or you need to have a celebrity, or you need to have incredible traction. Like we've done 4 million to date. We're growing 200 to 500% year over year. And that's still like not enough to push a lot of people over the mark. Partly a lot of people, macro environment, partly a lot of people made some not great investments in CPG in like 2020. because They're like, oh, it's to the moon. And it was really just like Facebook being great. And then iOS 14 happened and that killed the ad space. And a lot of companies died because of that. Uh, and then also even larger macro, you look at like Warby Parker and Away and some of these really big consumer companies that, you know, Warby Parker is still taking like $40 million losses every year. And so investors are looking at that and they're like, oh, is CPG, is consumer even like a functional investment like will i actually get money out or will it just be this sinkhole for the rest of your life and i think i personally think like i know some that have had really good um, raises and exits and everyone's made good money and i think it just is a you have to be a little more like fine-tuned rather than yeah you know, we'll just like throw money into all of these companies because you've got to deal with whole food that's not a guarantee of success I, can i just can i just do a quick comment there david so yeah, please, you know, we mentioned it. we mentioned friends and family a couple of times so that to me that is like super taboo i know it's the easiest money to get but it's super taboo because i don't and i don't let my family invest in anything that i work on because i want to enjoy my thanksgiving dinner i don't want them to be like yelling at me on my thanksgiving dinner um and and it's hard, right? It's hard because they're the people that are going to trust you, that are going to that are going to write the checks. But what they don't understand is that very few companies survive, and and I want I'd rather protect my family relationship and be friends with my siblings than uh, have them be angry with me. Wait, so Paul, so 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 what have you done when you've run out of money? Right? How, what, what, if it's not friends and family, what have you done? Uh, all right, so let's I mean let's go back to my first company that I started in my dorm room in in Madison, New Jersey. Um, I was a geeky computer science student. I'm still a geeky computer science student, I think. Um, and I literally didn't know the difference between AR and AP. Like I knew nothing about business, but I saw a problem and I and I saw a solution in a, a homework program, you know, program that I developed for one of my classes that could be used in retail in a very small mom and pop way, but it was kind of the way that I got started and literally put my computer in the trunk of my car and was driving around to different stores and showing them my application. Really, the first one, I just wanted to do it for bragging rights. I just wanted to go to, back and tell my classmates that I got a store that's using my application. But when I showed it to the shop owner, he asked a question that really changed my life. And that question was, he said, this, is, this looks great. How much do you want for it? Now I had no, thought of selling it or trying to sell it. So I got nervous and I, you know, I, I had to spit a number out and I wanted to say $300, but what came out of my mouth, cause I was nervous was $3,000. And before I could correct myself, the guy said, sold, you know, let's, let's go to contract. So I, now I had to figure out how business worked. So, so I didn't, I had no clue that people, there was an industry out there called the investment community that would invest in a startup company. I had no idea that that existed. All I knew is I needed to make more money each month than I was spending in the month, right? So it just needed to be in the black. Um, and that company never raised any money and was quarter over quarter, uh, increased sales and profitability quarter over quarter for 39 quarters. I had that 
that company for a long time before it was acquired. Um, I then, you know, when I went on to my next venture, I, I knew about the investment world. And this was like 2000 timeframe and the dot com boom. And I had uh, a, a dumb concept, quite honestly, but I wrote an executive summary. It was page and a half. And here I am, I'm out in California with two other guys, two friends of mine, and we're pitching it to an investor and we're sitting at the table and I, I'm handing out hard copies of this page and a half and I start going through it and I'm like, holy crap, there's a massive typo in the first paragraph. Like we didn't really proofread this. Um, and in that meeting, we raised $1.3 million. It was like just stupid. It was stupid money. It was a stupid time. And that company went belly up really quickly, right? So burn through that money really fast. Um, what I've done with Calamu is I've taken, you know, this is, this is a high-tech company. It's got to go through, you know, several stages of funding. Um, and I took a different approach. So I've, I self-funded it as much as I could, as much as I was comfortable with. When I started this in 2019, I had two kids in college. I had two kids. One was a senior and one was a junior in high school. So I had all of this tuition. It was kind of really bad timing. Um, I, I had a really good gig at the the New York uh, firm where I where I was executive managing director. And it's kind of hard decision to jump out and decide that I'm going to do this thing and not have an income and spend money. But I also live by the motto that if you're not all in, you're really not in at all, right? So I, I you can't see it because it's right here hanging on my wall in my office. But I actually have a sign that I made that says that to remind me every day, you got to be committed, you got to be all in. Um, so yeah, so with Calamu, I put my money in. And then I started talking to angels in my network and really getting advice uh, more than anything else and trying to get, you know, trying to get some interest and it was hard. I mean, I spoke to dozens and dozens of angels. I put together a pitch deck. I had, I got help putting together my pitch deck. Uh, I finally did get uh, a, an angel that I didn't know lives on the West coast, kind of a celebrity investor. You might know his name if I said it, so I won't. Um, and he was interested and he wanted to put $500,000 in, which was, you know, really considerable for me. And he said, I said, great. I said, let me send you over the paperwork. And he said, well, I'll put my 500,000 in after you show me that others have put in $500,000. I'm like, well, you know, how am I? I said to him, I said, look, I got, I have everything in this thing of my own. Like I believe in this. Uh, I said, I could lose my house over this venture. And he said, yeah, I got it. That's good. But I want to see other people besides you believing in the idea. So just kind of a, you know, a magical thing occurred with people in my network where I told that story, they knew of this person and they decided that they were going to make an investment. And I called the guy back and he said, I said, yeah, I got $500,000 soft circled, right? That's what you call it. So you don't have any money in the bank, but it's just people verbally say they're going to give you money. And he said, how did, how do you make that happen? And I said, I made a few, made a couple of phone calls. And he says, all right, I'm in. And he wired the money. So that was kind of like the start of it. Um, so the seed round continued. The more getting the first investor is the hardest. Once you have an investor, it's easier to get the second. And then my seed round actually closed with Dell Technologies. So I, I they came in late in my seed round and bought out the rest of it. And never would have had that if I didn't have a bunch of other investors. Um, and then about six months, that was in two, mid 2001. And then about six months later, we closed our series A, uh, at, at $20 million with Dell and insight partners. And that was just early 2022 was a crazy time where valuations were sky high. Um, confidentially I'll share with this, this, you know, this call, cause we'd never published this anywhere, but the value, the post money valuation that we received on a pre-revenue company that didn't even have the product finished was $90 million. So I was jumping up and down and now I'm getting ready in about a year to go out from X round of funding. And it's like a double-edged sword that I got a great valuation early on. This is a lot that I have to prove to, uh, to improve on that. Amazing. It's like, so you, so you will hope you will be running out of money shortly soon also, I guess. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You yeah, know, I mean, it's so always about that, you know, when I close when I closed my series a, I had about three and a half months of money left in the bank and you got to be cool with the rest, right? Like you got to be cool with losing everything. Even right now. I mean, there's no, there's no, for sure. The Calamu is going to make it. There's a, yeah. there's a lot going on in the world and raising capital is very difficult right now. 
Um, but you know, you got to be in it to win it, right? You got to if if you don't if you don't get up to bat, you're never gonna hit a home run. Totally, all in or nothing. Thank you for sharing that, Paul. Abe, you're probably you probably have the longest running company out of everybody. Um, what's it been like for you to kind of run out of money and 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 kind of <laughs> what, what like kind of what do you do? You know it's it's like multiple miracles that have happened <laughs> over nine years um to keep this going and also i i mean a lot of it i think feel like is self-inflicted made a lot of mistakes um learned a lot and then managed to survive somehow by the grace of god um the including right now like there there's no money in the um food startup market anymore no it's um Anything that was a VC, there was a really frothy market, like I said, like 10 years ago, really frothy. And like, there was tons of money poured in and a lot of bad investments were made. Um, a lot of bad products were funded. Um, a lot of exits were had that were then burnt, burnt the strategic acquirers who then, you know, like, so if you look at like one company that I followed in the footsteps of was like Sir Kensington, you know, they were acquired by Unilever in 2017 in, um, um, for 140 million, a uh, great exit. Um, but like within a couple of years, the Unilever has started discontinuing all their products because they were an utter failure post acquisition. Um, and cause they were buying hype and not a real product or real business. So now there's a real focus on building real business right now. And there is capital out there, but it's growth equity in our food, which is not VC equity. And the difference is growth equity is much more private equity focused. They, they want lower, they expect lower returns. Um, so they expect, you know, a two to three time return vice a VC, like 10 to hundred time return, but they um, take less risk as, and so they want to see a company that is either profitable or very close to profitability on a path to profitability um, plus growth. And which is, you know, as you can imagine, very hard to do, um, but that's what they want to see. And uh, that's what's coming through. Um, I think one of the, if I talk, look back at my fundraising journey, journey, say the biggest mistake I made was raising too much money and also not raising enough at the same time. And the way I see that is because I was continually raising small bridge rounds, like every year raising a small bridge round that really only gave us six months to a year of um, runway. And that never allowed me to really work on the business, I was constantly working in the business, um, which means, you know, I was constantly dealing with the day to day and trying to survive and, you know, putting out fires. And we were never really able to do to implement the strategic plans that I wanted to implement that I had like laid out in the back because we we really couldn't budget for anything more than a couple months at the most. And, you know, we would take small bets and small bets. Um, and that worked for the first, first few million in sales. And then, it, you know, after, you know, after above a few million in sales, like it was really hard to keep scaling that on this like incremental basis. And so um, a part of that is like the investor mindset, the angel mindset, like if you get involved with angels um, and that was most of our investors were angels. We didn't really have a lot of funds um, coming in. So one of the challenges with angels is they all expect like VC returns and they expect VC growth after they invest in you. Um, so like that angel that writes you a $25,000 check expects you to take that and go to 10 million, 100 million in sales, and, which is just not realistic by any means whatsoever. And, you know, it's just, it's a problem. And um, if I were to go back and talk to smart investors, what they should be saying for a um, any company, but especially like a, a CPG company, it's like, take your time, don't worry about growth, get your S together you know, make sure that you have good product market fit, make sure you really understand the customer, make sure your marketing positioning, your positioning, your pricing, your production is all laid out really and tightly well so that we can have a good story and that you have a strong contribution margin still even at an early stage um, so that we have a you know strong story to go to then raise, you know, the seven, eight figure round to really start to, to show growth, right? Because that's what you want to do. You want to set up like a better storyline for this. Um, and instead we were kind of constantly pushed to be like, you have to hit this revenue mark. You have to hit this revenue mark. And by doing that, we just kind of ended up spinning our wheels too much. And like, you know, we would um, invest in unprofitable, you know, products or, uh, you know, or we would sacrifice margin to grow 
to get new sales, um, which was in the long term a mistake, right? And so um, be careful chasing revenue marks and really, especially in this in this new kind of more sober environment, like we were, the idea is really to try to focus on building a solid business. People should be putting themselves on mute. Sorry about that, uh, Abe. Sorry about that. No problem. Um, yeah, so it's, you want to, um, and, you know, part of the challenge that we, we faced was like when, when I first started, like all the big VC funds in food were like, you know, make it to a million dollars and we'll invest in you. And then like, you know, so we fought, fought, fought to make it to a million dollars in sales. And then they, the, they moved the market and they're like, okay, 3 million. Now we're investing at a, you know, 3 million. And then, you know, we fought to get to 3 million and then they're like five and then 10. And so like the, it was, we were like chasing a, a car that never, um, you know, you, you never like the, the goalposts kept getting moved for us. Um, and that was just like the nature of the business, like, post, you know, going from the frothy days of the early 2010s into COVID and then post COVID. Um, and now into this very sober um, post zero um, interest rate environment. So again, like uh, focus on your contribution margin very early on, make sure you understand your contribution margin, make sure you understand as it changes, don't build the scale too fast, like keep yourself flexible early on, like don't over invest in something um, just because you think you're going to have a 10 time growth immediately because that is what will burn you um and you know for a tech company that probably means like over hiring um uh, but for a consumer product company for us like it was a mistake like we opened up two warehouses um one on the east coast and one on the west coast and that was a massive mistake like we wasted just tons of money trying to maintain both of those warehouses keeping them both full and and um meeting customer demand um because we just really weren't seeing the volume yet um, to justify a bi-coastal warehouse. We should have just had one warehouse like in the middle of the country in Chicago or something like that for our major customers. Um, so like we wasted a lot of money on freight and on warehouse fees and storage fees and things like this by, by doing that. So, you know, that's something, you know, you need to just be careful about. Um, make sure when you're expanding, it's, it's really because you absolutely need it and you understand the costs that you're getting into. Yeah, I want to, you know, um, I, I want to just, uh, uh, I, 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 I want to ask you a kind of very specific question. I just want to let everybody know that Caleb had to jump. He had to catch a flight. Um, I think he's going to kind of record something and we'll kind of include it in our recap. But Abe, um, because I think it's, I, I think at least the three of you, it's pretty apparent, like you're not giving up. You don't give up. Like, and that's, I, I, I want to talk about that a little bit. We're, like, <laughs> is that something you had to learn? Or is that something that's always been in you? Like this idea of like, okay, I now recognize my mistakes. It's been nine years. Like, like, because that's, you know, that, 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 you know, strength, if you will, as an entrepreneur, either, like you either have it or you don't, but like, clearly I think the three of you would have it, but where does that come from? You think for you, you know, has it always been? You gotta be, there? you gotta be a little stupid, I think. <laughs> um <laughs> A little stubborn, a little stupid um, to keep doing this. It, um, uh, for me, I mean, I mean, obviously, I was, um, I'm a veteran. I, I was a Navy pilot for eight and a half years. Um, so, like, it that grit of like just pushing through, getting the mission done, kind of thing, kind of came naturally to me because um, it's just the you know that was the beginning of my career. That's what like how I was raised. It was like. All right, you got to do three flights today, back to back. Like, okay, let's do it. Like, that's what we're going to do. Um, you know, going to be up till five in the morning doing this. Um, yeah, that's what we're going to do. So that's, uh, you know, just so I just had that, like, in the back of my head. And I think that's why uh, veterans make um, pretty good entrepreneurs, typically. Um, uh, but the on the on the flip side too i mean i think you do you don't want to be honestly you don't want to be too stupid you don't want to chase something that that's really not working um and i think the thing that kind of kept us going and the reason we're still in business despite despite so many mistakes and like funding mistakes and and you know spending money on the wrong things sometimes is that um our products really do work like there's a reason that they should exist in the market there is a you know, there is a good solid product market fit. Like we get great feedback from customers um, and significant enough to, as a large enough sample size um, to make it justifiable. Um, 
and like we see really strong repeat sales and so that's kind of like what financially has actually kept us going right the strong repeat sales has made made sure that we kind of were able to survive because we always had some level of cash coming into the company um and allowed us then to like be a little bit more flexible when things got tough like right now like potentially like there's zero investment opportunity right now for us so we really have to we're figuring out everything to survive cutting back on all kinds of costs um and uh you know, I think that's that's an important thing is really, really, really understanding if you have a good enough product market fit or if this is worth it, um, you know, to keep going. Um, so and if making sure that you understand, like, yeah, that this opportunity is big enough too. Um, and, you know, I see I think the opportunity I still believe I believe in the products. I believe that we have this opportunity that we can take X amount more market. Um, I've seen it, I've seen it in the the numbers. Um, I'm deep in the data to really kind of justify all my hypotheses on this type of stuff. And, you know, we've, we've done thousands and thousands of tests with customers, consumers, and getting feedback, getting surveys, getting taste tests, doing all kinds of things, making sure that we do have strong product market fit against all of our products. Um, and, you know, so we, I believe in the product. I still believe in the opportunity and that's why I keep going after it. Like at, at the end of the day. I love that. I love that. Thank you for sharing that. That's awesome. Paul, what about you? Like what keeps you going with all this? I, well, you know, I mean, I, I agree with Abe. I agree with what I just heard. You have to be a little stupid, right? <laughs> so I, I kind of think being an entrepreneur is really almost a mental disorder. And I really don't wish it on, on, I have two of, two of my four kids want to be an entrepreneur and I'm like, Oh gosh, don't, why, why are you doing that? Why are you doing that? Um, yeah, I don't know what it is. It's like some crazy drive. And what the way my brain works is when I'm in a super stressful situation is when I think my clearest. I don't know why that is. And that, you know, it's that things are miswired up up here for sure. But um yeah, when I'm when I'm really stressed is when I push the hardest. Now it also happens to be, you know, super important to have a very supportive spouse. So I've got I have uh my wife is just completely a hundred percent supportive and behind me and gets it. Um, when I quit my job in New York City, I was you know, I met with a CEO. I we had lunch together. I quit. I got in my car. I'm driving through the Lincoln Tunnel, and I called my wife. And I and she, you know she didn't know I was going to quit, but she knew that I wanted to launch this company called Calamu. And I called her and I said, "Honey, I said, fasten your seatbelt. We're going for a ride." And she's like, "Oh boy." She goes, "You didn't quit, did you?" I said, "Yep." Yeah. She goes, "All right, let's get going." So that kind of that kind of started the process. But you know, I want to point out something else too. So my friends. My closest friends think that I have like the Midas touch and anything that I touch turns to gold and everything Paul gets involved with is successful and it has nothing to do with it. I work my ass off. I mean, I literally, I don't know how to turn it off, which is the sickness part of it. Um, I dream my business. I can't turn it off seven days a week. I'm sitting at the kitchen table at 10 o'clock at night, you know, with my laptop open and um, it's hard work. I mean, it's it's perseverance and tenacity and hard work, really hard work. Um, and that's why I don't really want my kids to do that because you don't have much of a life outside of your business. Yeah, your life is your work, and your work is your life, right? I think yeah. that yeah, you gotta uh, love, gotta love what you're doing. You gotta, gotta really love. believe in what you're doing and love what you're doing and think that you're solving a problem that the world has. And that's my motivator, right? It's not it's not trying to make a lot of money. It's trying to solve a problem. Love it. Love it. I want to switch gears a, a little bit. I want to talk about marketing for a minute um, because I think we've all heard it. Like the, you've even heard some of the, you've even heard some of the, some of the people that are in attendance, they have great ideas. They have great products. They have great patents. They have great this, they have great that, but like nobody knows about it. Right. And so how, how's marketing been for, for, Paul, oh, we'll start with you. Like just like your your overall thoughts on like how important marketing is, that idea of like spending money to make money, that idea of like using social media or not, or like clearly like, you know, we, we're not from the Insta generation. We're not from TikTok, but like, how's that your whole, your, your thoughts on all of that and how important or not important it is to you? Yeah, I don't, I mean, I don't think I'm a great, marketer to be honest with you but what i what i have done that's been effective is i've positioned myself rightly or wrongly as an expert in the field 
that I'm in, right? So, I, and with Calumbo, I kind of feel like I I am an expert. You know, my prior gig with the the New York company, um, I was an expert witness. I was involved in a lot of sensational trials that had to do with cyber attacks. Um, so I had the creds for it. And trust me, I'm not that smart of a guy. I just happen to have a pretty solid resume. But you know, a line on the resume doesn't mean I'm a smart guy. Um, so if I position myself uh, as being in um, as being an authority, you're going to get an audience. Then I would author a lot of things, a lot of articles and try to get them published. It's hard to get your first article published, but once you do, it's easier to get the second one. It's always hard, hardest to do the first thing in everything. Um, and then blog posts and social media and being active in, in kind of getting the word out. But quite honestly, with Calamu, we have, we've got a, I have a killer marketing team. It's a two person, small two person team on the West coast. Um, younger and really attached to social media. We do a lot of social media. We win a lot of cyber awards, and then we put that stuff all over our website. So we're building the credibility. Um, um, I, I hate to say this phrase, but it really is true. You got to fake it till you make it on the marketing, right? right? You got to just keep going and then let the world think, you know, you know, you're not as good as the, what how maybe the world is perceiving you, but trade shows, you know, just all, all the normal things that you would think of. We don't do, there's no such thing as direct mail. You know, we don't, we don't do that anymore. We, in fact, we do very little email marketing as well. It's mostly, mostly just social media. Got it. Thank you for sharing that, your, 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 your uh, strategies. Abe, what about you? You, you, you kind of live and die by your brand. So how important has marketing been and what are some of your strategies? Yeah, it's, um, Interesting. Um, it, obviously, consumer products uh, marketing is like one of the most difficult things out there. It's one of the most important pieces of it. Um, it's always the first thing to cut in the budget, um, but it's also one of the things you definitely don't want to cut at the same time because you want to maintain growth. Um, so it's um, what I, the two things I've really learned. Um, one is understanding um, what the marketing spend is, is going to bring you from a top line perspective. Um, and sometimes that just takes time and testing because, um, the data from one company, if you learn from another company, even if they're very similar to you, won't be the same as for your company or your product. Um, so one example is like, we had a really, really good, solid marketing strategy when we grew from half a million dollars to a million dollars to $2 million to $3 million. Um, like every year we did that for like four years straight. And without spending a lot on marketing, because we were, we had this very effective, like kind of field marketing, in-store demos, like um, couponing program, using sampling, a uh, virtual and in-person sampling programs. And um, these were high ROI, high conversion, because they were high touch, like you really like communicating, talking to the consumer, um, getting them to convert, letting them understand and believe in your product um, and creating loyal customers thereafter, like who still like email us on a regular basis, to, telling us how much they love the product. And thanks for contacting, getting in touch with them um, like that kind of thing really worked ex exceptionally well to get us to like above three million in sales. And then. I realized post that, that like, if we want to stay on that same type of growth rate, that like the same marketing tactics just didn't work anymore because it was adding thousands of new households um, when we needed to start adding hundreds of thousands new households because we're, because your growth rate, you have to add, if you want to maintain the same growth rate as you get bigger, you have to add you know, larger and larger numbers of households um, to maintain like a 50% or a hundred percent growth rate year on year. Um, and so I was way behind in getting into digital and we probably should have gone to digital sooner. Um, I kind of always saw it as like a throwaway. It, it was, a, it can, you can easily waste a ton of money on digital social media uh, marketing. Um, but it is like one of the only, and one of the best ways to, to do high scale. And so getting, we are now trying to last year, we did our first really kind of targeted digital campaign. Um, it was very effective. Um, and I just wish we had gotten smarter about it earlier so that we have this better uh, understanding because now we're leaning a lot more into digital social media marketing. Um, it's expensive now. It's not as cheap or easy as it was kind of uh, pre-2019, um, but it is um, still highly effective, gets you a lot of metrics, um, and you just have to really stay on top of it. And it's highly scalable too. So even now as our budget is tighter this year, 
we can't really spend like what we did last year on it. Um, I can still, you know, be very effective in boosting certain messages, certain posts and testing things out and driving that. Um, yeah, that's, uh, like at marketing's it's about the numbers and really like trying to constantly, constantly stay on top of the numbers. And I think that's, uh, one of the challenges as a consumer startup is like, we, we never really had full bandwidth to be on top of that. Um, and I think that's a, that's a mistake we've made in the past that I wish we had built out before and did more of that kind of more scalable digital marketing instead of worrying so much about potential ROI at the beginning. And, and Abe, are, are you, do you, do you have, do you have a marketing team? Are they in-house? Are they out-house? Uh, no, uh, last year, um, we had a little bit more money last year. So I hired a firm for the first time um to run a marketing campaign for us digital marketing campaign for us where we targeted stores and um targeted uh social media campaigns yeah within a five mile radius of people living a five mile radius around the store that carried our products and um we luckily we have good syndicated data access to syndicated data so we can measure and see lift in those stores every four weeks based on and so we could measure we would do three weeks on of, of marketing one week off and then measure the quad week um sales increase year on year or um quad week to quad week on those stores and uh that was um we found it to be incredibly incredibly effective and there seemed to be like a lasting effect so we were seeing repeat sales coming from it as well like a, a sustained lift is what we call it in the store um and that was um so really effective um but the it cost more when you look at the full it was a high ROAS investment when we look at just the media spend, the marketing spend one, but when you look at the entire spend of like hiring and, and maintaining the firm, um, it's it's the ROAS kind of go the return on ad spend ROAS um really gets significantly diminished. Um these firms are really, really expensive. Um they're not as good anymore. And the things I'm hearing is they're they're not as um, effective anymore because a lot of the, these firms they just want to kind of set it and forget it and kind of just take their monthly retainer in um and these days you really need to stay on top of everything and be tweaking it and the ai tools are getting better and better at targeting it automatically too better than people so you want to learn about how to, how to use those so we started using those as well um so i am now kind of bringing this all in house and me and one other person um on our team since we only have a very we have a very small team like only four people so me and one other person are the ones who are focusing on this stuff and trying to add this into our toolbox, um, which is tough because it's just a bandwidth situation. But um, again, that's what you have to do when money's scarce and you still need to maintain growth. Abe, I want to just say thank you so much for your transparency and your candor and your honesty. I think uh, I think everybody really appreciates it. Thank you so much. No uh, Paul. You know, Abe has talked a lot about mistakes made. I think that's oh, I mean, we could always we, we should always be learning from our mistakes. Have you like can can you talk about some of the mistakes you've made and like what you've learned from them? So you say mistakes. I like to call them learning opportunities. Okay, yeah, I love that. That's great. That's better. <laughs> that's um, better. <laughs> um so I don't want to call them mistakes because I think you have to make them, right? Yeah. That is how you learn. You've got to do that. If you're not making mistakes, you're not taking on enough risk in how to build out your business. Right um, and, and you know, kind of as a side note, I kind of, I taught that to my kids. I'm a downhill skier and I taught my kids how to ski. And when I taught them how to ski, I said, they were afraid of falling down. And I said, if you're not falling down, you're not skiing hard enough. You're not skiing at your ability. So now I don't really, from skiing, I don't think I really follow that equation anymore. At my age, I don't want to fall down anymore. But in business, you got to make mistakes. You got to keep, you got to keep reinventing, you got to keep taking risks. Um, I think, um, you know, if I think about mistakes that I've made in the past, one of them that I continue to make, and I just know it's, it's a learning opportunity for me, is uh, it's super important to hire slowly and fire quickly right? You've got to have the right people in the right seat. And when you first start, like employee number one in your company is likely somebody that you've known for a long time. You know, it's likely somebody that you've got a, a friendly relationship with. And it's probably almost always the wrong person to hire as employee number one in your company because they're, they're not they're not the right person. Um, so 
Yeah. I mean, just vetting out who you're building your early team with and making sure that you're, you have people that are complimentary to you. You don't want to, it's not important to have fun with them, right? You don't, it's not important to be buddies with them. It's important for them to have the same drive that you've got and the same belief in what you're trying to build. And they're complementary to the skill sets that you've got. Um, and that's a mistake that like I, multiple companies have made that same mistake over and over again. Um, I think the other thing is uh, something that I've learned over time is everything takes longer and everything costs more money, right? So when you're putting together your business plan and you got that hockey stick, and, you know, all this, the same novice stuff that, you know, we all do when we're putting together the initial, the initial business plan, that's just pie in the sky, right? I mean, when I was doing my seed round um, pitch, I didn't have financials in there. And, and some investors were like, well, what are you, I, how can I even write a check if you don't have financials? And I'm like, you want me to make something up? I will make something up. But you know, the truth is I have no clue. So we're going to build this product and we're going to approach the market. We're going to try to get product market fit and we're going to see where it goes. So, you know, don't, don't lie to yourself. Be, be honest with yourself and know that things are going to take a lot longer, cost a lot more and be a lot harder than you think it's going to be. I love that, Paul. Thank you also for your honesty and, and candor and transparency, both of you, really. Um, I, listen, I want to, we're at the hour. Uh, anybody want to ask a question of Paul and Abe? This is your opportunity, no pressure. Um, but if you want to, then please maybe take, put yourself on video and then uh, take yourself off. Uh, I'll ask you to, yeah, just just let me know or or, or maybe raise your hand. Um, so if anybody wants to ask anything, now is the time to do it. Um, if there's no questions, I have plenty more. But if you if you want to ask a question, just let me know. We're going to kind of wrap it up uh, uh, shortly. But I kind of wanted to ask if, if anybody wants this question, they can just raise their hand. But Paul and Abe, I want to kind of get your thoughts on this. Um, I, I kind of want to like, so, so he, you have a room full of kind of entrepreneurs uh, uh, it, who are, who are in various stages of their journeys. Um, and, and, and you've all, you've given great kind of nuggets throughout, but like, uh, I, I kind of want to know what, what advice would you give them? Just the first thing that maybe even comes to your head, just curious. I'll start with Paul. Um, I, so, you know, I have all these mottos, so I'm a little bit. Yeah. We like mottos. That, but, um, <laughs> So, you know, one of them is I I say often, no one ever learned how to ride a bicycle by reading a book, right? So there's a lot of good business books out there. I read a lot, you know, and I have a lot of favorites. I've got some, you know, right behind me on, on my desk here. Um, but they are tools, man. They are not, that is not your blueprint. And too many startups that I see fall in love with an author or fall in love with a book and say, this is all I need to do to be successful. And no, 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 that's just the tool. You got to, you have to get on the bike, you have to fall off the bike and you have to get back on the bike. And I think, you know, that is probably the best advice that I can give is you got to, you got to go out and do it. A um, couple, couple of other, you know, just random things. Uh, it's super important to me to be solving a problem. This is not about making money, which maybe, you know, maybe I'm just crazy that it's not about making money, but it never has been for me. So it's about trying to solve a problem. And I, I talked to one investor, a, a, a very well-known investor that my law firm, you know, reached out and he, and anyway, short story is the partner at the law firm that I use, I use the, a law firm called Cooley, which is very, uh, you know, very, very high end in the uh, tech startup world. They've got, they represent all the big. Uh, tech startups. But the partner called me and he said, hey, this investor XYZ, I don't want to say his name, uh, called and wants an introduction to you. He wants a meeting with you. He goes, this has never happened before. I'm like, great. When does he want to meet? He said, in 15 minutes. I said, great. Uh, you know, COVID. So I'm going to meet with the guy over Zoom. And I pitched to him and he was really, really interested in what I was talking about. And at the end of the call, he said, what is, what is your number one priority? And I said, my number one priority is to make the cyber world a safer place. That is my number one priority. And he goes, eh, and like literally did this. He goes, eh. and I said, what? Well, that's not my number one priority. He goes, no, he goes, You're, the right answer would have been, you want to make me a lot of money. <sighs> I said, whoa. I said, hold on. I said, that's not my, that's not my priority. I said, I think if this problem is solved and if Calamu can do this, I think it's going to make more money than anybody could imagine. 
but that's not why I'm doing it. And I said to him, I said, look, I let's, let's agree to disagree and let's stay friends, but I don't, <laughs> let's not, I, I don't want your money. Right. I don't, let's not, let's not continue the conversation in that direction. So make sure that you're solving a problem um, and then ask for help. Right. So when I was starting out, I would identify on LinkedIn people that, that I thought could really help me or answer questions that I had. And I'm talking about like chief information officers at major corporations, global companies. And I would reach out to, I had no idea who these people were, right. And they didn't know me. And I would figure out a way to, to get a communication to them. And I would say, I'm not selling you something, but I have an idea and it, you're one of four people in the world that I think could help me. Wow. And, and you know what? You get these people on the phone. It's amazing that you will actually, people want to help people. And, and uh, if you're not, if you're not a jerk about it, and if you're going about it, you're really sincere, you will get those people uh, on the phone. Um, and then use your network, expand your network, right? You got to, you got to keep doing that. I belong to a group called the Entrepreneurs Organization, which I will shamelessly plug. Uh, it's eonetwork.com. Um, look, look at that group. It is fellow entrepreneurs that have the same struggles that you have, that I have, and just speaking through experience on how they confronted uh, an issue or solved a problem. Um, and then the last thing that I would say is, you know, what we already talked about is perseverance. You got to be ready to go on this thing, roll your sleeves up and be in it for the long haul and not worry about anything else and not think, I don't have any vacations planned this year, right? So, I mean, I, I go on vacation with my wife several times a year, but right now, you know, we just realized tomorrow's our anniversary and and we're usually away for our anniversary and i said wow we don't have anything on the calendar for this year and she goes yeah your head down she goes I, I get it i understand it again the supportive wife which is just fantastic but perseverance and just keep pushing awesome thank you thank you thank you paul abe what about you advice to everybody on the call paul we'll get to you shortly i mean i would just summarize um kind of what paul said everything i definitely what everything paul said you should take to heart um network is incredibly important um taking the time to get um to really research the industry before you 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 really start to um i think helps more um having a network before you start helps a lot um, one thing basically that i like to tell other entrepreneurs all the time is that you know don't believe the hype um especially over the last like 24 years um there's been all this kind of like hype and aggrandizing around entrepreneurship and you know the lifestyle and like these entrepreneur superheroes um the, you know, the solo the myth of the solo entrepreneur and everything like that and um don't don't believe that stuff like when you scratch the surface um behind it there's usually um another story to tell um and it's not always necessarily like a, a a um like that they almost failed but that happens a lot too a lot of the times like these guys had like an unfair advantage like massive unfair advantage getting started so don't benchmark yourself against somebody else and somebody else's story um you know to give you an example and if you all are familiar like sweet green it's a great restaurant chain launched here in dc um three georgetown graduates like literally 22 year old kids started it and now it's like a you know, it's IPO'd. So I think it's like a, a huge valuation. I don't even know. Um, but very, very successful. Two, I mean, you're like, oh, these were just kids. They were 22 years old, right out of college. They just, you know, hustled and launched this, you know, salad concept. And like, that's not really the whole story. Like two of the three of the founders came from two of the biggest restaurant families on the East Coast. Like, so just a massive heads, you know, starting um, point, uh, massive unfair advantage that they had like coming into that now of course i'm not taking away anything away from them they've done an incredible job it's a great restaurant chain and they've you know they've turned it into a very successful company um so obviously you know they, they took their advantage that they had and they really did something with it um but you know don't benchmark yourself against somebody like that like realize that for you it's going to be a lot harder if you don't have that same kind of personal network um and you know, as you get started, your network really does make a huge difference. This is not a meritocracy that we live in. Um, it is America is not fair. The capitalist society that we have right here is not fair. It is jilted towards those people that have a better network. And and I've learned this as a veteran starting a business that didn't have the same kind of uh, you know business background, business network that a lot of other people did um, getting into this industry or any startup industry. 
um, you really have to, you're going to have to work harder and you're going to have to like kind of prove yourself more um, in these types of situations if you're getting into an industry or, or a startup that you don't have a personal network or connection to. So um, be aware of the unfair advantages out there. Um, that doesn't mean I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm telling you not to do anything or not to start a company or that you can't be successful. Just letting you know that the realities of it um, are going to be harder. So don't, don't believe the hype, the media hype the uh, podcast interviews, things like that, that you're going to hear. It's it's going to be, uh, these things are harder. Um, a lot of these entrepreneurs that you think are incredibly successful got like $10 million grants from their, their parents to get started. Like it's, there's a lot of unfairness out there. And you as long as you're aware of that and you're going to this with wide eyes wide open, I think that's the most important piece. I was just about to say that eyes wide open period, for anything you're going to yeah. get yourself into, eyes wide open. Paul, what is your question? Yeah, so um, earlier, um, Abe, you had mentioned that. Um... Oh, sorry. Oh, my God. I just totally I muted him. Paul, I'm so sorry. That's right. <laughs> um, so, Abe, you had mentioned earlier that, um, you know, a lot of angel investors um, had, at least what you saw, they, they wanted really big returns, like VC style returns. Um, are there, and you said obviously to look for one or to try and find people that understand that, that more of the slow growth, are, are they out there typically and are they out there in this market now? And I guess that's for everyone. Yeah, I mean, I think like um, when I first got started and like even like five years ago, they weren't out there. Like if I pitched a um, angel group, um, pitching angel groups was one of the most painful things I ever did. And I did that for years nonstop. Um, the uh pitching the angel groups like because typically they were always benchmarking me which is like a catch-up company against some high growth bio biotech or um software company that like was seeing incredible returns which was not physically possible for a consumer product company right like exponential growth is incredibly difficult for a consumer product company because you're, you have to literally create product <laughs> and like so the working capital constraints are are real on that and um you know, you can have great linear growth and even hockey stick growth or like hyperbolic growth, but, but exponential growth is incredibly difficult. Um, now, I think every kind of industry is kind of coming down. So hopefully, I think things are becoming, um, again, more sober and expectations are more sober. I, I'd say even three, four years ago, expectations were not sober. Um, so it was very hard to find angels that were interested in, in like kind of a more rational business model. Um, uh, I haven't been out pitching recently, so I, I really don't know what the expectations are right now, um, or how fast people are adjusting to this. Um, so, um, I think we're in a changing environment right now. And I think you have to kind of just get out there and feel it and, and talk to the angels and talk, be, have an honest opinion, um, conversations up front with any investor about like kind of their expectations on return and what they, the, what they're looking for and on time frame. um, and what they're benchmarking your business against. Okay. Awesome, Paul, Paul. Did you have did you have some thoughts on this? Uh... Yeah, I. I mean, first off, I. But I love that you just ended with be honest, right? I mean, that it's I think so critical to not sugarcoat things and be honest with your audience. Uh, but the other thing is qualify the angel investor, right? So if you're pitching to an angel investor group, under get an understanding, ask them, you know, what is their investment criteria? What is the amount that they typically invest? What are their expectations? It's fair to ask them that. Um, I had one individual angel that I had met with and he was interested in the product. And I think we had, this guy strung me on. I think we had like nine scheduled Zoom meetings. And then I don't know how many phone calls. The guy would like call me at, you know, during dinner and call me on Sunday and, you know, which doesn't bother me at all, but it was just a lot of airtime that I had with this guy. And then he finally said, all right, I'm ready to move forward. I'm ready to write a check. I said, great. I said, uh, how much? And he said, well, I spoke to my wife about it last night and we're going to invest $11,000. And I'm like, oh man, 11, I just did a lot of work to get $11,000 out of this guy. And it was actually the, the smallest amount that I got from any of the angels and probably the most amount of time to get that. So I've learned to, you know, qualify and see what their expectations are. Ask them what their their typical check size is. That's all fair to ask up front. Awesome. Paul, did you. you did you have a okay, awesome. Uh, Jock, you have a question. Put yourself off mute. <clears throat> Jock. Yeah, Take yourself off mute. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. My question is for Paul, Paul and Abe. Would you be open to be contacted by by us? Because you know you have a lot of insight, and I'd like to introduce you to my my company and my new product, my patent. Yeah, I'd be I'd be open. I mean, I'm I'm here, you know, I'm here presenting to you guys because I want to give back. So, yep, for sure. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn, or you could get me at calamu.com, or or just email me at plewis at calamu.com. Okay. Yeah, hey. sure. I'm I'm happy to help if I can. Do do you um how do how, what's the best way to contact you? I'm the only Abraham K Mark in the entire world, so if you go on LinkedIn, <laughs> it'll be very easy to find me. Um, okay, so. great, awesome, thank you. Anybody have final questions? Now's your time. Else, we're gonna call this to an end. So, if you have a question, raise your hand. Okay, cool. Uh, Paul, Abe, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for, for, for again, your honesty, your candor, your transparency. I think it's uh, a second to none. So really, really, really thank you. Um, we have recorded this. We will send it out um, probably uh, after the Easter holiday next week um, with, with some contact information for Abe and Paul as well. It will be posted on our, on our uh, Gerhard Law YouTube site as well. We have another ESS coming up at the end of the month. So you'll see some marketing about that. And so we hope you will join us. Um, there is a question that came in after. Lior, what's your question? I can't say. What's up, Lior? Hey, guys, how are you? Sorry for uh, the last moment. I was just That's wondering. Okay. I was just wondering uh, if you have any um, advice how to find uh, the good partner for your um, project Ooh, that's a that's a that's a big question <laughs> that's a big question i know i know yeah. i know only yeah. if you have time like shortly Thank yeah you. i you know I, like i said earlier you want to find somebody that's going to complement your skills not be duplicative of your skills right that that does nothing for you uh and someone that believes in your vision and where you want to go yeah, um, I've had a bad co-founder in the past. Uh, somebody I had to get rid of in the first year, year and a half that we were um, started this business. So it was very painful. Um, so uh, you know, go slow on this. It's worse than getting married. Honestly, starting a uh, uh, an investor, a uh, getting a co-founder. Um, so I'd even go slower than what you do when you're going getting married. And um, the only thing I would really um, be careful of is just to try to check on is like. How does this person react when things are going badly? Um, because everybody's great when things are going good. Um, but, you know, some people don't show their true face until things are going really badly and things are difficult and like money is involved, things like that. So that's the kind of person that you need to know who you're getting in bed with. Yeah, and, I, I, I and totally another, go for and another personal financial situation. Like that's a that's a tough conversation to have, but. I had a, a co-founder in the past that, you know, just one day out of the blue, he said, I can't afford to do this anymore. And then he goes, I quit. And that was that. And he had equity. So then that, there was a whole big problem with how do I get his equity back into my hands? And he thought it was worth a lot more money than I thought it was worth. So we had all those arguments. That's so, always the case. Yeah, so, right. Always. Exactly. exactly. There's never yeah. an agreement on that. <laughs> exactly. Which, which brings me, Lior, to what I wanted to say was if and when you do find someone that shares the same passion, uh, you need an agreement straight up. I mean, none of this, like you need a co-founder's agreement, a shareholder's agreement, whatever it is. So like, don't, 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 don't trust anyone is what it comes down to. So make sure that you have an agreement in place. Uh, I appreciate that. Thank you. Awesome. Appreciate thank you. Uh, thank you for that last minute uh, uh, um, uh, question. Again, everybody, thank you so much. Have a happy holidays over the next uh, um, over the next month. Rachel, I think we we the, the 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 actual chats are being saved, so that will be part of kind of the whole the whole video stuff. But um, again, thanks, Abe. Thanks, Paul. Thanks to everyone for coming. Look out for our marketing for next week for next month. And uh, take care, everybody. Have a good day. Have a good evening, wherever you are. Happy Eastern Passover for sure. Bye. Thanks, Thank you, David. you so much. Thanks, everybody.